here we go. Welcome everybody to a, another uh, episode of Big Ideas. I am going to be your host, Dr. Jeffrey Hanna, where what we do is we go through some relatively recent uh, research and we try to break it down into plain English so that it's going to be useful, A, for the practitioners who need to know it, but arguably more importantly, for people who are experiencing a number of health conditions and looking for answers. And today what we're going to be looking at is unilateral atlanto-occipital injury, a case series, and detailed radiographic description. This one here is going to be for people who experience any number of symptoms that you associate with a head or neck injury whether it's going to be a headaches, migraines, dizziness, vertigo, neck pain, shoulder pain, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, jaw issues, the list goes on and on and on. And point being, this is going to be for people who have been to the doctor, you've had standard x-rays, you've had CTs, you've had MRIs, your report came back and it said that everything is normal, there's nothing wrong. Yeah, maybe some soft tissue injury, maybe some degenerative arthritis, but after that everything says that it's okay. This article here is saying that is not necessarily the case. And so we're going to explain this in a little bit more detail. So let's go ahead and jump into it right away. Atlanto-occipital dissociation is a highly lethal ligamentous injury at the craniocervical junction, right here, top of your neck. Previous studies have described rare cases of milder forms of atlanto-occipital injury, which might be managed non-operatively, but there is a paucity of literature on the subject. In other words, not much. We included patients with radiographic evidence of unilateral, one-sided, occipitocervical joint, capsular disruption, distraction, or edema, um, uh, plus or minus injury of the apical ligament, tectorial membrane, anterior atlanto-occipital membrane, posterior atlanto-occipital membrane, alar ligaments, and cruciate ligament. We propose that ligamentous injury at the craniocervical junctions functions more as a spectrum rather than dichotomous diagnosis of which a subset can likely be managed non-operatively. Now don't worry, we're going to explain what that means in plain English. But in a nutshell, it's that when you're talking about head neck injuries, it's not necessarily a black or white kind of issue. See, especially if you go to the, the hospital, what are they looking for? They are looking for broken bones and gross dislocations, the things that are going to potentially kill you. They're not looking for some of the, the more subtle things that even though it may not kill you, it can certainly make your life oh so terribly much miserable. And when you're looking for something like that, you can still see it, but there are a lot more subtle clues and you have to pay particularly close attention. Otherwise, those things can be missed. And we're actually going to be talking about then here things that are, in the grand scheme of it, relatively small. But we're also going to be giving you a few numbers that we know through some of our own research, which supports this particular article here, that is going to let you know, well, why is it that so many of these things, you know, why, why has nobody told me this before? So let's go ahead and start at the, the beginning. Atlanto-occipital dissociation, that is dislocation, extremely dangerous for obvious reasons. As the literature surrounding atlanto-occipital dislocation has grown, one evolving topic is the clinical and radiographic definition of the injury because of often subtle nature of the injury and the extremely high risk of neurological compromise with delayed diagnosis, a variety of radiographic criteria largely based on pain film and commuted tomography have been established. What does this mean? It means that there are long established protocols for identifying when you are dealing with major dislocations of this area. But, as we scroll forward here a little bit here, however, with the increasing use of MRI in these patients now understood that what was once considered a single diagnosis of atlanto-occipital dislocation is more likely to represent a spectrum of ligament injury that may warrant more nuanced approaches to treatment. What this means is that just because you may not have a true dislocation, 
does not necessarily mean that everything is actually okay. There can be injuries to the soft tissues, to the ligaments, and standard x-ray and CT, guess what they show? They show hard bony tissue. So yeah, they will show fracture. They will show dislocation, but they don't show the soft tissue injury necessarily so that you actually know what's going on. And even then, I will actually add, they don't talk about it in this particular paper here, but even when you are looking at soft tissue injuries of the upper neck, sometimes even something as slight as a couple of millimeters, as small as that is, is sufficient to cause an issue. But if you're having an MRI that honestly, just simply put, doesn't have a high enough resolution, imagine instead of looking at your 1080p or your 4K TV or even your 8K TV, you know, if you're lucky enough to have one of those cool things, that if you're trying to look at something uh, that would have been like 20 years ago, the resolution simply put isn't high enough to detect these very, very subtle things, unless you know, again, exactly what you're looking for. So in particular, incomplete or unilateral atlanto-occipital dislocation is an entity that has been described in some published series, but is often analyzed as part of the broader cohort without separate consideration. Others have also proposed the concept of a milder, this is the one that we're going to be emphasizing here. Milder con uh, craniocervical injury within the spectrum of dislocation that can be managed more conservatively than the more severe forms. However, clinical data regarding this entity are lacking. I mean, I might actually disagree with that one just a little bit, but it's a question of where are you looking for that particular information. And this is because where they're going to be looking is pretty much in a hospital setting. But as we'll be describing, this is something that upper cervical chiropractors, you know, the kind of uh, work that, you know, we do in our practice, this is the kind of stuff that we see all day and every day. So before I jump ahead any farther, I'm going to mention just a, a couple of things about the, the nature of the architecture in the upper part of your neck, how it is supposed to move and what the normal tolerance of movement is. So firstly, you're going to consider joint spaces. And it's worth me pulling something out of my pocket here because, of course, I carry one of these around. This is a, my keychain, and this is a approximate size of the real uh, top vertebra in your neck called the atlas. And what you may see located right here is that the joint surfaces are going to be approximately the width of your finger, so about one centimeter or maybe a little less than half an inch. And then it's going to be a little less than one inch in terms of its long ways dimension. And normally, the joints of your skull, and there's two of them, they sit right here. And the way that this joint complex is normally supposed to move is not unlike a rocking chair, but a rocking chair that can actually move in three dimensions. And what that does is that facilitates this movement of your head right here. Now normally the two surfaces are supposed to glide back and forth no problem. There should not be a space between them exceeding usually about a single millimeter. As slight as that is, that is the total amount of movement that you should have between the two. If however you start to see stretchiness where the two parts are offset and pulled apart, that is evidence that what you've had is you've had disruption to what are called the capsular ligaments. It's the ligament, it's the connective tissue that surrounds the joints themselves that offer that primary integrity. Now, in terms of dislocation, what they're looking for is they're looking for where, if you would, the head has been lifted off of the edge of the atlas. And of course, that's not going to be a good thing. But what we're going to be talking about in introducing the additional possibility is that you don't necessarily need to have a dislocation, but if what you have is a joint offset, and this would be a case where, again, not broken, not dislocated, but what it does is it offsets and it side slips off to the side or forwards something like this, or if you would, something like this that will manifest as a person's posture. 
or their head, or their shoulders, or the rest of their spine and their body appearing to be crooked, creating muscle tension down one half of the body. It shows up any number of different ways, but you can appreciate then if from the outside a person metaphorically, they're walking around like this, slightly over-exaggerated, all day, every day, guess what that's going to do? That's going to put compression on this side of their body, and it's going to be stretching, producing irritation on this side. One way or another, leading to a, a potential host or a, a range of uh, different problems, Things, again, that may not necessarily kill you, but can certainly make your life miserable. Now, under normal circumstances, what we expect is we expect for not just these capsular ligaments, but all of these other ligaments that are on the inside of your neck to maintain and to hold the normal, neutral alignment, motion, and stability of your head on top of this little vertebra here. But if you've had a soft tissue injury, beyond even a couple of millimeters. I mean, in truth, it's actually, it's about three millimeters. Um, your normal vertebra up in the top, they can move like this and that's no problem, but you can imagine if you kept your head like this on purpose, 24 hours, you're gonna start to experience a few neurological signs and symptoms, even if you don't necessarily have a problem there. But you can appreciate then that if something has actually gotten stuck or it has been uh, locked out of its normal position because of an injury, then what you've got is a persistent issue in terms of neurological, um, neurological disruption. And what we know based on looking at the architecture and the amount of give that we actually have through these ligaments, we know that we have a grand total of about three millimeters worth of total give or about an eighth of an inch before a person is going to start to experience problems. And it's not necessarily going to happen all at once, but it will certainly accumulate over a long period of time so that we start to add up the stresses that occur, whether it's the physical injury, whether it's whatever we attribute to just simply getting older, these things add up. And there comes a point where our body just can't adapt to that stress anymore. And that's when we start to experience aches, pains, other kinds of problems, things like that. Now, even though I've said that normally three millimeters is the total amount of give that you actually have, the truth be it, the way that we often look at films and based on the nature and the way that most people's architecture is, depending on the way that you're viewing films, the total margin of error before you usually start to have issues is usually about 1.5 millimeters. I'm not going to get into those intricate little details. That's a whole other discussion in and of itself. But yada, 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 yada. When we're looking at articular disrelationships, as slight as 1.5 millimeters between the base of your skull and between the C1. What we're saying here is that represents potential injury. And even though it may not reach that criteria in terms of what's called the dislocation, again, there's enough problem there that it can be causing issues that are gonna manifest as pain, aches, other problems, things that are affecting your health, your lifestyle, your well-being, your everything. So what's the point from all of that? Because I threw in a few extra little intricate details that honestly you probably don't really know. It's that very small things can still cause very big problems if they're allowed to accumulate over a period of time. So on that note, Let's get back then, because that's me sharing you a little bit what we know from the upper cervical chiropractic perspective. But why don't we go ahead and we're going to have a little look uh, back here. I'm trying to line myself up. I know I'm a little crooked here. We're going to try to then look at it from what they were looking at it from the medical perspective. So what they did was they started with a total of 727 cases that they wanted to study. And what they did was they narrowed it down where they said, okay, we need to find people who have had a CT scan and an MRI, and we're going to do comparisons. We're also going to be looking for people of a recent traumatic injury where there was some evidence of a one-sided occipitocervical joint, so again, between your skull and between your upper neck, either A, capsular disruption. So we're talking about some kind of an offset and a disrelationship between the skull and between your C1. Distraction, so the separation, or edema, swelling. 
plus or minus injury. And now what they did was they had a look at some of the other ligaments that normally provide stability in this area. The apical ligament, this is a relatively small but nevertheless important ligament. It sits on top of your C2 vertebra, anchors your C2 to your skull. The tectorial membrane, this is a much bigger ligament, also anchors your C2 to your skull. The anterior atlanto-occipital and also the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane, this is a broad ligamentous sheath that envelops all of the structures that are in this area. So not just the joints, but also a couple of very important arteries, veins, and also nerves that are supplying the base of your brain and your brain stem, and or either of the alar ligaments or transverse uh, segments of the cruciate ligament. This is the ligament that's involved with maintaining the stability between your C1 and your C2. If that is ever injured or disrupted, it is an, again, extremely dangerous extremely dangerous kind of injury. And what they did was they then analyzed these ones and they did a series of measurements. And this is one that I'm going to be picking on here. The one that they were looking at for in particular was this CCI, condyle C1 interval. Again, we're talking about the total amount of offset, the total amount of displacement or space between the two joints. Now, out of those 727, they found eight that actually met their study criteria. So, in all honesty, this is not a big study population. But nevertheless, from this eight, we are going to find some very interesting kind of things. So, check this out. Out of the eight, on CT imaging, five people had a right-sided right sagittal craniocervical uh, interval, and three patients had a left craniocervical inter interval that was greater than two millimeters. So, there was evidence of some kind of capsular ligament injury between the skull and the C1. It may not have reached the criteria of true dislocation, but something was not right there, and it was showing up on at least one side. They then had them do MRI on everybody. Six of the patients had increased short tau inversion recovery signal in an occipitoatlanoid joint unilaterally that corresponded to increased uh, craniocervical interval on CT imaging. What does that mean? It means that you can see signs of swelling, signs of soft tissue inner, uh, injury, and it matched the side where they actually saw that actual joint injury on the CT in this particular case. Three patients had unilateral and three had bilateral alar ligament injury, which is what provides stability to your head and your neck as you do this. Only one patient demonstrated injury to the atlanto-occipital membrane, uh, excuse me, the anterior atlanto-occipital, while three had injury to the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. And so again, this means that, and if you consider that the nature of whiplash kind of injuries like this, you can have an injury kind of deep on the front or it can be deep on the back. One patient had complete and another had partial injury to the tectorial membrane. Again, this is what provides stability as you're going to be doing these kinds of movements with your head. And you can appreciate if there's not stability in that area, as you move your head and your neck, it's probably going to go at different joints and angles. Why? Because things are not sitting or moving exactly the way that they are supposed to. One patient had a complete rupture of the ascending portion of the cruciate ligament. Oh dear. And another four had injury to the transverse ligaments. Again, may not have been full rupture, but yeah, there's definitely, you know, some issues going on here. Two patients were found to have a complete disruption. Another had a partial tear to the apical ligament. Finally, seven out of the eight had increased short tau um, inversion recovery signal change in the interspinous ligaments and soft tissues between the occiput and the C2 vertebra. Again, evidence of soft tissue injury, even though there was no actual dislocation for any of these people. And the point being here is that we're illustrating that even though we talk about dislocation, we talk about upper neck injuries. There's not just one kind of upper neck injury. It can be any number of different combinations at different sites, 
at different locations that's going to be specific to you based on your genetics, based on your anatomy, and based on the individual nature of the injury or in some cases the compound or the accumulative natures of injuries that you actually have going on. And thus, it's not necessarily appropriate to just always give everybody the exact same kind of treatment protocol. Moreover, because of the complexity that's going on here, just because, again, somebody says, oh, you don't have any fractures and dislocations, you just, you probably are just fine. That does not necessarily add up. And again, even if you have had MRIs, and even if the MRIs did say, no, no, we didn't say anything, I will say this, is that this upper part of the neck, curiously, often does not go properly reported. A lot of standard MRIs that I see in my own practice, if they're looking at the skull, they stop at the level just before C1. If they're looking at the neck, they stop just at the level of C2. So this critical juncture, oftentimes, does not even go visualized in the first place. And again, because we are thinking of it not to say right or wrong, but simply put different perspectives. Typically speaking, from a pathological standpoint, most radiographers, or excuse me, radiologists or pathologists, they're not considering injuries unless there has been a frank dislocation or where you see articular offsets by at least 50% of the joint surface. And guess what? That's going to be, because you remember what we talked about, the size of these actual things? That means that they're not considering something significant unless you're seeing an offset somewhere between five centimeters up to a whole centimeter, depending on exactly how you're looking at it. And what these guys are saying, and what we've been saying in the upper cervical world for a long period of time is, no, 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 no. You can have much smaller injuries that can still cause major issues and problems. So it's good and it's encouraging that now we've got some other people who are saying, okay, no, 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 we need to kind of have a look at that. But the question then is, well, what do you do about it? What do you do about it at this point? As our understanding of this injury pattern and the biomechanics of cranial cervical junction has grown, it is worth considering the possibility that injury to this mechanically complex region could represent a spectrum rather than binary classification of dislocation versus not. Again, just because it's not broken dislocated doesn't mean that everything is okay. In this case period, we have sought to emphasize this point by describing the radiographic findings and clinical course of eight patients with unilateral cranial cervical injury that does not represent a complete dislocation. They then talk about how other, offers, or other authors have kind of propo proposed a few different similar things. These guys here, Barbella and others, proposed a three-stage classification in which stage one patients were defined as stable minimally or non-displaced cranial cervical injury in which there is sufficient preservation of ligamentous integrity to allow for non-operative treatment. What does this mean? It means that if you are seeing that, again, not dislocated and not, you know, unstable either, that it's like, okay, wait a minute, you don't have to go in and do surgery or screws or collars or anything like that, that you can actually manage this conservatively, naturally. Now, they don't go to the extent here of by saying, you know what, you need to go see an upper cervical chiropractor in this case, not somebody who's just going to, you know, twist and crack your neck and stretch things or anything like that. No, no, no. Somebody who's going to be very precise. As we said, there's a lot of things that are going on in this very delicate and also very important area. You need to know exact location direction, and degree, how your individual joints fit together to within half a degree so that you can be as precise, gentle, specific, and safe as you possibly can so that you can actually help resolve these kinds of conditions. So again, they don't say, oh, you should go see an upper cervical chiropractor, but they are saying, okay, hey, you know, we don't have to go to the nth degree to oftentimes help these people, which is a good thing. There's a time and a place for all things in the healthcare arena. In our own series of eight patients with this injury pattern, the most presented, or excuse me, the most presented after high velocity motor vehicle crash or falls. On presentation, the vast majority were neurologically intact without, without lower cranial nerve deficit. Do you know what that means? It means that the vast majority of these people who they found all of these injuries with. They had a physical injury. 
They were admitted to hospital, but they were not showing signs of neurovascular compression. In other words, yeah, they might have had, you know, some aches and pains. And they had all these problems going on beneath the surface. But their neurology was still working, at least at that time. And this is oftentimes the case what happens to people. And part of the reason why I do these videos so that, you know, people can appreciate and understand this. So many of us, we, we have injuries at life, whether it is, you know, the stresses that happen when we're a little kid. So we take a header off the bunk bed, tumble down the stairs, fall off the bike, sports injury. Then we get a little bit older, car accidents, slips, falls, bang on the head. And we think, wow, whew, I'm lucky I got away with that one. Well, necessarily not. Just because there's not broken bones or bleeding does not mean that there was still not some kind of a disruption going on on the inside. And again, when we're talking about a couple of millimeter discrepancies. This may not be something that's going to cause immediate pain or problems, but what it's going to do is it's going to add up over days, weeks, months, years, decades. And then when your body just can't adapt to that stress anymore and it accumulates to that point, you start experiencing those issues and guess what? You attribute it to getting older or you attribute it to, oh, I have too much stress going on right now, when the reality is, is that it's not what's going on in your present reality that actually produced the issue. It's whatever had happened in the past. And of course, if then we understood that as human beings, if we realized that if only I'd have known back when I had that injury to get this checked, it would have been much easier to correct and to resolve. And so we, unfortunately, we oftentimes have to learn these things the, the more difficult way, but it also is an opportunity then, because if you unfortunately have had to go through a circumstance like that, it also gives you the ability to share that message with other people. So guess what? They don't have to go through that same kind of process. So this is why we, you know, hammer that uh, point home over and over and over and over. So the consideration of partial atlantal occipital injuries begs a more important question. To what degree of ligamentous injury can be tolerated and at what point the upper neck becomes unstable? This is a really, really good question. You know, I've talked about, again, from the pathological standpoint, they, in this article, they're saying it's about two millimeters. Oftentimes, you know, these things are not diagnosed until you're talking about three to five millimeters. And I talked about how it can even be less than two and still be causing issues. Unfortunately, these guys here, they, they don't have a complete answer. While our own series lacks the power to definitively answer the question of what degree of ligament instability can be safely managed intra uh, non-operatively, it is noteworthy that only three out of these eight people in our series underwent occipital cervical fixation. In other words, surgery, the rest were able to be managed naturally. And I'm willing to bet without actually knowing the data here, Maybe it is in there. Let me see. Did they... Uh, no, one person passed away. They don't actually define that, at least that I can see there. But I'd be willing to bet that the people who did actually require surgery, they were the ones who had the disruption of the alar ligaments and of the... Um, and of the transverse atlantal ligaments, because as I said, ooh, those ones are dangerous, uh, and you don't want to muck around with those. And so this is very important, you know, concept that we often try and try to, you know, explain things. And it's because there is a good amount of misinformation that's out there right now. The idea that just because you again have a neck injury, the concept is, oh, you know, is this unstable? Should somebody be actually working with your neck? Is it potentially dangerous? Is this safe? You go through a series of tests first. Without doing tests, you don't actually know that. Then yeah, you're asking for trouble. But if your tests are showing that yes, there is a problem in your body, what is the nature of it? And then understanding the nature of it, that then gives you the avenue in terms of what you need to do it. So if a person has a true dislocation, guess what? I'm not the person who you want to see. I'm going to say, you need to go see the surgeon like ASAP. But if the surgeon is saying, no, no, everything seems to be okay. 
Well, guess what? That again, doesn't necessarily mean the case, but what it means, it means, thank goodness, you're not dealing with fracture dislocation, but you could still be dealing with something that's going to show up in different kinds of ways. And though, even though that report did come back as saying, quote unquote, everything is normal, it's then up to you trusting your own intuitive sense, that wisdom coming within you. If you have that sense, something is wrong. It may not always be what you think it is, but it is worth exploring. And again, especially as it relates to head neck kind of injuries, this is the kind of thing where certainly, you know, even if not myself, but I would strongly recommend go see an upper cervical specific chiropractor, even if you've been to see a general chiropractor, simply put, because this is different and this may offer you a different approach to be able to help you actually uncover and find the resolution of what you're actually looking for. So we've made it here mercifully to another episode of or another ending of Big Idea. Hope as always that you guys found this one was enjoyable. If you have any comments, questions, please do put it in the chat box. And if you enjoyed this video, three things that we always ask you to do. Number one, please do click the like and the subscribe. Why the like in particular? Because it helps YouTube recognize that this is actually valuable information so that other people who need to find this are going to be able to find it as well. So you can help them. Number two is if you actually know somebody, be it family member, friend, coworker, where hmm, you'd probably benefit by taking the time to listen to watch this video, please do share this video with them. And then number three is if something in this video has sparked something in you and you're thinking, I need to explore this a little bit farther. What I would have you do is go over to our website, which is UpperCervicalSpokane.com, where we've got all kinds of other articles, all kinds of other information. If you're in the area, certainly we would have you get in contact with our office, schedule a special consultation. We'd be happy to help you out. Otherwise, go to BlairChiropractic.com and you'll be able to find an upper cervical specific chiropractor who's going to be a little bit closer to you. So as always, thank you guys very much. Until next time. Take care. Be well, live well, stay well.